In September of the year 1984, 751 individuals in Dallas, Oregon became violently ill with food poisoning. Local health authorities linked the outbreak with unsanitary food preparation, contaminating local salad bars with a strain of salmonella, prompting the swift closure of the restaurants and eventually causing the outbreak to subside. Six months later, a local cult leader called Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh confessed to the attack. However, his confession was not taken seriously until a federal investigation a year later linked the strain of salmonella to the cult's laboratories. The motive behind this biological attack was to test and prepare for a larger scale attack that would target the local water supply before election day, rendering local voters unable to place their ballots, allowing the cult to vote in several members of their organization into high elected office. These positions included the local sheriff and several members of the county circuit court. The plot only failed after locals caught wind and voted en masse to prevent the cult from winning any county positions. This event marked the first known bioterrorist attack in the United States in the 20th century, as well as the single largest bioterrorist attack on US soil. Despite the implications and insidious motivation behind the attack, the case was not publicly discussed or written about in medical literature for another decade. Biological weapons such as those used in these instances are classed as weapons of mass destruction due to the significant harm that they can cause to numerous humans and the biosphere. However, bioweapons present a unique threat when compared to other weapons of mass destruction such as chemical or radiological weapons. Weaponized bioagents have the ability to quickly spread through a population while maintaining and growing its number. For example, a weaponized strain of smallpox has the ability to proliferate and spread through a city, increasing the amount of damage and death it can cause. While bioweapons are scary on paper, pathogens rarely mutate naturally to the point that they will become a pandemic, and when they do, the fatality rate is usually fairly low. Combine this with the fact that some specialist knowledge is required to utilize and deploy a bioweapon, and it is clear to see why only a handful of attacks have occurred. Or at least this was the case, up until 1987 when a niche medical journal published a fairly mundane paper that, unbeknown to them, would change the world forever. The information published in this paper described the DNA sequences known as CRISPR, which when combined with the enzyme Cas9 forms CRISPR-Cas9 technology, a method to edit the genomes of living organisms. While CRISPR was technically discovered in the 80s, it would take a further 30 years for its function to be fully understood, and then another 8 years for it to be shown that CRISPR technology can be harnessed for genome editing. But why does this matter, and what does it have to do with bioterrorism and weapons of mass destruction? CRISPR and genetic engineering in general is a textbook example of what is known as Dual Use Research of Concern, or DURUK for short. DURUK is research that is intended to do good and benefit public health, but can be easily manipulated for harm. CRISPR technology is the mother of all double-edged swords. On the one hand, it can be used to cure all genetic disease and create super crops that can feed the world, but on the other it can be used to create a bioweapon that could topple civilization as we know it. But I know what you're all thinking. This all seems a bit far-fetched and firmly in the realm of science fiction. However, if you don't believe me, then take a look at this article from 2015 warning that engineered pathogens and synthetic viruses are a reality, and that the current system as we know it is not fit to address the threat they pose to global biosecurity. If you are still on the fence, then consider the very real and ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and its effect on global stability. Keep in mind that COVID does not have a particularly high mortality rate, compared to other influenza strains. I feel like this is a good point to address the fact that COVID-19 is not an engineered pandemic program for Chinese domination, and it probably didn't come out of a lab. The current scientific literature supports the fact that it is a naturally occurring zoonotic disease, however it does raise a very disturbing question. If a disease that isn't engineered for lethality can damage public health and the global economy to this extent, what effect would an engineered virus have? Now I know there are a few omnis skeptics out there that still need convincing about this emerging threat, or at least some of you that think we are 10 or 15 years away from this being a real issue. However, what if I told you that a contagious strain of the H5N1 influenza virus, also known as bird flu, with a mortality rate of 53% has already been created, and it happened 9 years ago in a Dutch lab. Scientists from the Netherlands altered the viral genome so that mutant strain could easily attach to mammalian nose and tracheal cells, However, the virus could not spread between individuals through the air. To overcome this, the researchers exposed ferrets to the viral strain and used nasal fluids from the sick animals to infect others. After only 10 rounds of this process, the virus had gained the ability to spread through the air, becoming airborne. This strain differed from the original by only one mutation. 
According to Michael Imperial, professor of microbiology, the technology of making influenza viruses from DNA clones is widely available. And while not simple, it's not beyond somebody with basic knowledge of molecular and cell culture techniques, implying that the barrier to entry to replicate this work is quite low. This work has been widely criticised in the scientific community as needlessly dangerous. However, the authors of this research argue that their work could help in detecting the occurrence of a new dangerous virus, like the one they created in Nature. However, as an article in the journal Nature explains, in practice the immediate benefits are minimal. The mutations that we know about are likely to be outnumbered by those we are still ignorant about. The article goes on to point out that research into reducing the time for creating new vaccines would be more useful, a problem that we are experiencing right now in the current COVID pandemic. It's been a few years since this infamous H5N1 study, but improvements to CRISPR-Cas haven't stopped. With studies that improve the accuracy and reduce the cost being published frequently, it was only a mere four years after this study when the first human embryo was genetically modified, and progress in the field is certainly not slowing down. Due to the nature of bioterrorism, some specialist knowledge is required to weaponize a pathogen either through modifying genomes or simply selecting for lethality like in the H5N1 study. However, this opens up a unique insider threat, where biologists across the globe have the potential to become extremely effective terrorists. The US Commission on the Prevention of Weapons of Mass Destruction, Proliferation and Terrorism recognizes that, given the high level of know-how needed, we should be less concerned that terrorists will become biologists and far more concerned that biologists will become terrorists. The 2001 anthrax letter bombs eventually pointed towards Dr. Bruce Ivins, who initially helped the FBI in their investigation but later became a suspect, resulting in his untimely suicide. This demonstrates that insiders within the life sciences have the potential to use their knowledge for harm. As of 2015, there were 50 unregulated private companies in the US, China and Europe that had the potential to create their own virus from scratch. And let's be honest, this number is probably much higher now. This number does not include state-sponsored programs to edit viral genomes either. The Soviets were doing it back in the 80s by inserting Ebola genes into smallpox, and let's be honest, if the Soviets were doing it, the Americans probably weren't too far behind. By now you are probably convinced to some degree that bioterrorism is a real and growing threat, but surely the nations of the globe are aware of this and have measures in place to counter it, right? Well I checked out both the United States biodefense strategy and the UK's plan, but please bear in mind that I am in no way qualified to criticise these plans, however I can probably judge to some extent how fit for purpose they are. Starting with the UK strategy. The major point hammered home is that the government's response must be underpinned by the right scientific capabilities and capacity. However, the government's current response to the COVID pandemic has drawn considerable criticism from the British scientific community. So how willing would the government be to actually take advice from the scientific community in the event of a bio-attack? The document does briefly mention the threat of an insider attack in the context of working with academia to identify it, but the government weirdly seems to think that the dark web possesses more of a threat than an industry where the equipment and knowledge is readily available. The report insists that the UK has in place a comprehensive and well-tested system for rapidly detecting and identifying disease outbreaks. However, is that true? Especially with how long it took for the government to respond to COVID, a threat that had already been identified. The British strategy is pretty vague, obviously they won't go into massive detail for security reasons, but the threat of an insider attack, which the 2015 paper suggests is the most likely source, seems to be glossed over. However, despite all this criticism, the US strategy somehow manages to be even worse. The US biodefense strategy isn't exactly bad. It stresses how important it is to work with teams abroad and the need for state governments to work together along with identifying an insider threat as real, and we need to be alert about it. However, where it all starts to fall apart is when you compare it to how the US has reacted to the very real and current threat of coronavirus. For example, the US strategy states that ensuring domestic and international biosurveillance and information sharing systems are coordinated. But the US has pulled out of the World Health Organization the largest biosurveillance and health organization in the world. Their strategy also involves promoting the development of international legal frameworks, which is laughable considering that the US pulled out of WHO. The document also includes the strengthening preparedness to operate and collaborate across the United States, including US territories, which is hilarious when you look at how coordinated the various states have been in their response to COVID. 
with some states even competing for medical supplies. If so much of the US's strategy has been thrown out in the name of partisan politics, then why should the rest of the document be taken seriously? COVID-19 has shown the serious flaws in international biosecurity, bringing the international economy to a grinding halt while not being particularly deadly. It certainly raises the question, what would happen if a more deadly pandemic hit? Could society even hold together and combat a pathogen engineered for high mortality and disruption? In 2016, the 8th Biological Weapons Conference took place with countries from around the world convening. All countries of note agreed that biological weapons are strictly banned and should not be used in warfare, but that's about where the agreement ended. It seems like the conference developed along the usual geopolitical lines, with the US blaming a certain country for not participating in negotiations, Russia blamed the Western nations for not negotiating in good faith and not being willing to compromise. And in the end, nothing was really agreed on. The next conference is scheduled for 2021 in Geneva, and perhaps in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, nations can finally agree on some sort of international response to the growing threat of bioterrorism and pathogens in general. While it does seem a bit kumbaya, this report on the Ebola outbreak in Sierra Leone, which has a ridiculous amount of authors, makes the point that a culture of rapid data sharing is critical for teams around the world to have the best current information about a circulating virus or ongoing disease. Not to point any fingers, but some countries should perhaps take this advice to heart. And I don't know, maybe not threaten to buy the entire share of COVID vaccine when it becomes available, and maybe don't buy entire stockpiles of life-saving drugs denying it to other countries. But maybe that's just me. The 2021 conference may create some kind of united global response to this growing threat, but I'm not going to hold my breath. At the end of the day, the threat of a terrorist attack is fairly minimal at any given point and you shouldn't live your life around the threat of them or the terrorist kind of win without doing anything. However, it doesn't hurt to be prepared, especially when we have the mother of all examples of what could happen if a bioattack did go global. Still, it's probably not that productive to worry too much, especially when there are far more pressing issues that are having laughably little done about them on the world stage. But that's a topic for another video. Thank you very much for watching till the end of the video. I know it's been a while since the last one, but please do remember that the world is a bit on fire at the moment, and I've been quite busy. If you like this video, then please check out some of the other ones on screen right now, and don't forget to subscribe and click the bell icon to be notified on the rare occasion that I do make a video. Apart from that, follow me on Twitter for updates, and uh, join my Discord if you want to ask me questions or just chill. Cheers again for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.